I'd like to just take a few moments uh, to discuss with you the elements that I feel that are needed to make a good box. For me, they should be well designed. All the proportions should be in balance with the overall size of the piece. They should be aesthetically and functionally pleasing. The craftsmanship needs to be of the very highest order. The boxes for the gallery market should have the grain running through them. The interior of the piece, as far as I'm concerned, should be a mirror image as far as possible as the exterior. This will keep the tensions within the piece more equal. The lid fit is one of the most important elements within the box for me. Loose, ill-fitting lids are, to me, a failure. What one would need is to be able to turn the box upside down without the lid falling off. It should be a pleasure to handle that piece and remove the lid just with a minimum of pressure. Having made those opening comments, perhaps we should look at some pieces and explain what I mean by that. These two pieces here, the design elements, are absolutely equal, although they look very different visually. They're virtually the same height as you can see. These are a common type of box that I make, and the proportions are very much what I use a great deal of the time. What we have here is two-fifths of the overall length in the lid and three-fifths in the base, and that is exactly the same within this piece here yet visually they look very, very different. I'm going to show you another box which is very different in form. The proportions are different also from the one that I showed you earlier. This has got a two-fifths, three-fifths relationship. This has got one-third in the lid and two-thirds in the base. It's very important that the finial is of the right size. If it's too large, it dominates the base. If it's too small, it looks like a little pimple. This is an in-fitting lid which has a tight suction fit. Having mentioned in my introduction about things being proportional in their correctness, this box illustrates this to good effect. What we have here is a six-tier box and each tray grows in length and diameter as it goes down from the top and all the elements that grow from a form through here. If we remove these flicked elements out of here, we would have a line through there. And all of those things grow from the piece. And they all fit together, as you can see, and they're all growing in proportion or decreasing in whichever way you view it. When we stand this back, you'll notice that the lid here is slightly larger in diameter than the base. It's just like a roof on a house. This design, of course, is based on a pagoda. I'd just like to take a brief moment or two to discuss with you timber selection for making boxes. This is a very important element. You can't make good boxes with poor wood. The best are made from dense, close-grained hardwoods. Exotics, to just name a few, such as rosewood and the ebonies, and the domestic timbers, such as the fruitwoods, and in, a, in the USA, dogwood and it, boxwood in England. Uh, you need to have timber that is very dry, certainly less than a 10% moisture content. It needs to be free of checks and splits, and then by preference to be straight grain. You should try and avoid open grain, fast grown timbers which have soft pockets of growth within them and uh, things of this nature. Softwoods don't usually make good boxes. To keep to the dense exotics and the very dense hardwoods of all sorts of descriptions. Having just outlined those few thoughts, let's take a look at some of the woods and some of the problems that you can encounter along the way. The first piece of timber that I've got here is cocobola. This is a wonderful straight grain piece of timber that will make super boxes. The only drawback with cocobola, like many of the exotics, it does have an irritant. Sometimes this, to me, affects me like snuff and makes me sneeze. I always work with dust extraction, so it isn't a major problem. But do bear in mind that a lot of these exotic timbers do have irritant nature to the breathing and to the skin in many people. The next piece that we've got here is a piece of kingwood. Now what I'd like to do with this, just with these 
black marks you can see penciled in here just to explain to you that if you cut this block from here and made a little box from there this would be extremely difficult to match the grain as you can see it's diagonally across here but just with a little bit of thought if you cut this one from here and just flatten that end across and squared that end up in parallel with this at right angles to this grain you'll find that the grain will run nice and straight through the box the next one we're going to look at, and this is the one that we've made all the boxes that we've shown you in the videos. This is Massa Birch from uh, Scandinavia, and the reason that we've selected this piece, as you can see, it's a mottled type of grain rather than a straight grain. And being light timber, it shows extremely well on camera. It works extremely well also. It's not a timber that I would normally think would make good boxes. But this timber is dense enough and that interest in the figure makes some very nice pieces. I hope during the videos that we show you that you will think that too. The next piece of timber that I'm going to show you here is a piece of Rio Rosewood. You can see there's a large sap element within it and we have a check down here. Mark that out with a felt tip pen to see that we can get a block of that size from it, which will be sound. What we've still got here is an element of sapwood, which is rather dominant for a piece of this size. It would be far better if this was made a little bit smaller and we'd just get a highlight of sapwood within the piece rather than this dominant feature. The next thing that we have, well, you, what you need to do is always to bandsaw the ends of the timber. You can see on this piece there's some major problems of checking here. It's all through here. If I flex that, that would just break wide open. We take another cut from that. As you can see here, we've still got major checks here and there's still a faint check through there. If we flex that, that will open and break just like that. We take another slice and you can see here it's now beginning to get sound. We've still got this major check here and this one there, but we could well cut out a nice sound little square out of there to make a very nice box. We've just been discussing some of the elements and problems that you find in timber. This little box here, which is coca bola, just highlights one of the things we touched upon. This has got a soft element of sapwood here. You can see but it's only just a little highlight. If this was much wider this would be too dominant for a piece of this size. What we have over here is a U-box. This is quite a large piece and this has a large sap element in it. This is like a patch on the side here and goes in quite deep but because of the scale of the box it is easily carried and looks well within the piece. This next box here which is made from spalted beech shows the problem that you have with very busy grain timber when it moves dramatically. What happened with this piece, that lid was parted from there and we've only lost half an inch of material and it's been set inside here. But you can see there's a dramatic grain mismatch because of the flamboyant nature of the grain pattern in that timber. The last box that I'm going to show you is one that we've made in the videos that you're going to see. This timber is Massa Birch and doesn't have a particularly dominant grain pattern. And this way you can do things with this wood that you couldn't with many other species. In fact this box has been made with the grain not matching through it. But because of the elements within there this is very difficult to detect. I'm now going to show you a number of ways of securing your work in the lathe to make your boxes. The first method that we're going to show you is the glue chuck. For this, you need a face plate and a waste block. This is secured with screws. You turn a flat face on here and then you turn a recess into this piece. You then mount between centers your stock and turn a tenon on this, which is then glued within the waste block. This is a very direct and secure method of holding. Another method of holding, and probably the most direct, is the screw chuck. For this, you can use a square section of wood or a pre-turned cylinder. What you need to have is a central hole and a flat end here. This is probably the most direct method of holding, but wastes more material. 
Another check that I'm going to show you is the scroll check. This is a check I use a great deal myself. First of all, you mount a square between senders and turn it into a cylinder. You turn a spigot on the end with a slight taper. This is then mounted within the chuck and the jaws close down on it. There are a number of these chucks now available on the market. For this you need a waste block that you secure with screws onto your faceplate. This is then mounted on the lathe and the face is trued up and a recess cut into it. You then turn a cylinder between centers and cut a tenon on it. This is then mounted within this block and this can be glued with white glue or a fast setting glue. The next chuck that I'm going to show you is a screw chuck. This has a parallel thread with a deep cut. This is made specially for wood turners. There are a number of these chucks on the market. This is then wound onto the spindle and you have a block that you have either square or into a cylinder that has a pre-drilled hole in here. This face must be flat. This is then entered up onto the screw and gives a fairly secure fixing for you to be able to make your box. The first thing that we do is to lock the headstock. We then wind the chuck onto the spindle. We have here prepared a block that has the spigot turned with a slight undercut. This then goes into the jaws and the lock ring goes down onto that tenon. This gives a very secure fixing. We release the pin and we're now ready to turn our box. We've been taking a look at the boxes that I make on a regular basis that I sell to the craft galleries in Britain and sell at the craft shows there. The first box that we're going to show you is the spigot fit lid box. As you can see as we move the lid, there's the spigot and it has the sapwood running down the side. The second box that we're going to show you is the finial box, which has an infit pop lid, as you can hear. This is the vacuum caused within the piece. And the third piece, which is the basic box, which has got a small bead on it and also a spigot, is a very simple basic piece. When you're roughing things down, it's policy to wear a good face shield. The minimum requirement would be safety glasses, and for the sort of stock that we're turning, which are only two and three inch squares, these are normally adequate. To protect your lungs, the minimum requirement would be a good face mask. What I work with at home is a powerful dust extraction at the back of the lathe, and when I'm turning larger pieces, I also wear a respiratory helmet. Uh, when we talk about lathe speeds, the type of stock that we're working here is 2 inch and 3 inch squares and normally I work these between 1200 and 1500 RPM. What we're going to do now is outline the first three steps in the making of this basic beaded box. As you can see, this is a demonstration one that has got the little bead cut there. And now I'll go to the drawing and show you the steps as we go along the way. What we have here is a cylinder that has been turned between centers and has a, a spigot fit there with a slight undercut that fits into the jaws of the scroll chuck. The first stage in the making of this piece is that we true the end surface of here. At that stage we then mark the length of the lid and part in with a small narrow parting tool. We then come back to the end here and hollow this interior out to conclusion. We tool it to, to the total conclusion and sand that and polish it, whatever we're going to do at this stage. That is then completed. We then part this through, remove the lid and set it down. The next stage is that we go to this drawer in here and we turn a tenon on here which will accept this lid. That slides over that tenon. This should be absolutely parallel, just as the fit inside there should be. Once that is on there, that's a friction hold that we've now achieved. We come then down to the third drawer in here, and we tool the total outside of this piece, coming down and turning across the top and creating the little bead. 
The enlarged detail drawing here shows it. We've got the bead here form, little radius inside the lid, and the side wall and the lid are virtually the same thickness. Now let's go and make the basic box. What we've got here is the bandsaw cut in here. This stops the timber splitting if this was very hard. This is now mounted between centers and ready to turn into the cylinder to make the box. The first thing we need to do is to rough this cylinder down. What I'm using here is a three quarter inch roughing gouge, but you can use other gouges if you wish. This will reduce it quicker than most. What we're looking at is we're rubbing the bevel of the cut. We're cutting downhill all the time. And most of the time, the flute of that gouge is 45 degrees out of the vertical. We're just checking to make sure that the cylinder is smooth. At the moment there's still some square sections on there. We're cutting back. You can cut either way once you've got that into a true cylinder. We're just checking to make sure that that is nice and clean. Now we're taking the 3.8 beading parting tool to turn down across that end grain. And what we're going to do now is to cut the tenon. There we go, we're going to cut the tenon here with a slight undercut. Our cylinder's now true, so we remove our stock from the lathe. We'll show you now that we've got a little undercut on the spigot that will fit within the scroll chuck. It shows the clean edge there and the top. We've locked our lathe spindle and mounted our scroll chuck onto the lathe. We now enter the stock, the spigot goes inside the jaws and we tighten down onto it. We've taken a little 3-8 spindle gouge to clean that end off. You could do this with other tools, a skew chisel is used by many and I certainly do this on a lot of the boxes I make. Sometimes these cylinders don't run exactly true, you just need to true them up with the gouge. You're just taking some light cuts to make that absolutely true. We need to measure the length of the box here. You can see it's three and three quarters to define the length of the lid. This will make about an inch and an eighth long. This will give us enough length to cut the spigot and to have the thing in proportion. What I like to do on these type of boxes is to have two fifths of the lid of the visual size and three fifths in the base. We take the eighth parting tool and cut to the headstock end from the pencil line. We check with the depth gauge now to make sure what depth we need to hollow out internally. I usually leave about 3 sixteenths of an inch of material in the lid. I'd just like to share a few thoughts with you on tools. Over the years, this is I've been making boxes. This extends back something over 17 years now. What I've found is that the need to modify certain tools to help me achieve my, my goals. All of the tools that I use are standard tools that you can buy, but are ground extremely differently. Usually gouges, skew chisels and scrapers. The first one that we're showing you here was a three quarter inch straight scraper, as you can see on the right. The one on the left is the modification made to it. You can see that the bevel is ground back down the side wall. There's a small radius on the end and it's sharpened across the tip as well. 
The next tool that we're going to show you is a half inch skew chisel. You can see the one on the right is ground in the normal angles on a skew. The one on the left has a far more raked back angle and a much longer bevel. This we're just showing you here using the point of the skew chisel to create the detail and using it as a sheer scraping tool. Forming that bead round there to remove the undulations left by the gouge. This skew has got a slight crown on it so as the heel and the point don't dig in. What we have here is a modified 3-8 spindle gout for the end grain hollowing. The one on the left is the modified one. It has a very obtuse angle about 60 to 65 degrees and you could see it's ground right up the side wall. That side grind will come into play at another time. I use it very much like a chisel, like a skew on the outside of the boxes to get a good clean surface. Got a very short obtuse bevel, it's ground down the side wall and this will be used to hollow the whole of the interior out. That side wall is only really clearance, it doesn't help in anything you're doing in the hollowing of this box. What we need to do is to find the centre of that piece. The point is goes directly in like a shell auger. It's positioned with the flute almost vertical. In fact, it's about 10 or 15 degrees out of the vertical. What we're going to do now is to just show you the movement that you need to make with this gouge with the lathe switched off. You can see there's a lot of pivoting movement there. The flute of the gouge is positioned so it's about 45 degrees out of the vertical. And you can see that it's a pivoting movement. The tool is held very lightly on the front end with your index finger and thumb. All the movement comes from the right hand as you pivot that round. That short bevel allows us to get support as we manipulate that tool. Continuous repetitive cuts with a pivoting, almost like on a fulcrum. You can see you get very clean, fast cuts. And now at the side wall, that is much more of a scraping cut. There's no bevel support as you're coming up there. The fingers have automatically gone outside as that is getting thinner. I'm now going to show you a modified three-quarter inch scraper. It's been ground down the side wall, as you can see, about three inches. It's got an undercut of about 15 degrees. It's a small radius, and across the end, again, it's 15 degree undercut. I'm just taking the cuts across the end there and up the side wall. Just checking the depth here, as you can see, that seems to be pretty good. Now I'm checking the side wall. It's slightly undercut this time. Pick the tool up here and take a little smidgen off the aperture there to make that parallel. That should be enough. I'd like to just spend a few moments with you talking about finishing, abrasive papers, waxes and sealants. The papers that I use are normally silicon carbide papers. I use these because I can use them with the wax to act as a lubricant. If you use just dry papers you often generate a great deal of friction heat 
which can end check the timbers, particularly in the very dense exotic timbers. If you use the wax, this minimizes that heat and gives you a much superior finish. I normally start sanding with grits that are around 150 grit and finish up around 4 to 500 grit. The final finishing is normally carried out with 4-0 wire wool, which is dipped into polishing, polish. This acts as the lubricant and gives an excellent finish. Normally, on the very dense timbers, I finish these direct with a wax which is uh, petroleum based. On the more open grain timbers, I normally seal these with a cellulose type lacquer. This is normally flatted back with the 4-0 steel wool and then a wax applied over this and buffed to conclusion. The one thing that I don't like to see is the very high gloss finishes. I like to see a satin finish and if I do obtain that high gloss I normally flat this back with 4-0 steel wool to give me the desired effect. We're now ready to start sanding. I use silicon carbide papers in narrow strips that I fold in half to give extra support. I always dip this into a soft paste wax. This minimizes friction heat and helps to prevent end checking. Start in the middle using the two fingers out there and as you pull up that wall be careful not to soften the aperture. Working now through the various grits, I usually use 180 grit after the 150, then move on to 240 grit, 320, and finally finishing with 400 grit. On the very fine timbers, very dense close grain timbers, I'll often go down as low as 500 grit. Being very delicate on that aperture. Now finished using the abrasive there. Picking up some 4-0 steel wool, again dipped into that wax as you can see. This will remove any little scratches that are there from the, the abrasive paper. I'm now going to seal the piece with a satin lacquer. The soft cloth dips into it. I apply it onto there and rotate the piece by hand, spreading that evenly over the piece. Once that's done, I now friction dry it. Build up a friction heat as you do this and it cures the, that lacquer very quickly and allows you to finish off totally. I now use the soft paste wax and 4-0 steel wool dipped in there to cut back the surplus sealer. Just move that over there. I'm now going to apply a high quality soft paste wax to the revolving stock. This will give us a nice satin finish. Polished there, friction dried, as you can see. Now the interior is finished, it's time to part the lid from the body. We now take an eight parking tool to go down and we stop when we've created about a three eighths to a half inch tenon. I prefer to cut the lid off with a saw. This is for safety purposes and stops the tear of the fibre. Notice that the tenon is cut clean from the saw cut and there's no tear out into the lid. We now need to clean the top of this off just a little bit where the parting tool left a raw edge. I'm going to check the inside dimension with the vernier calipers here so that I've got this to check the spigot that I form to fit that lid on. I'm now going to cut the spigot with a 3-8 beading parting tool. This is a tool I like to use a great deal. Check the diameter with the vernier. A little bit large. Okay. Now 
I'll go again. Reduce it slightly. That's a little bit loose. Now I'm going to extend that spigot and we should get a good fit. Make it slightly larger. That's good. That's a nice friction fit. I'm now going to screw this body up and I'm using the modified half inch spindle guide. This gives us a shearing cut all the way through and the bevel is rubbing behind that cut the whole time. You could use a skew chisel, but I find on a lot of timbers the gouge is better. It doesn't pick up the little splinters that you can sometimes get with a skew on the very dense exotic timbers. We've now come to measure the length of the body, put in a pencil mark on there so we're getting the proportion right. What we shall have here is a two-fifths of the overall body in the lid and three-fifths in the base. We've marked the length of the body now. With the eighth parting tool I define the length of the piece. We're now going to true the top surface of the piece up. We're using the 3 8 spindle gouge. True that surface through. I'm just going to define the little bead here. Now I'm using the point of a half inch skew chisel. Lay flat on the rest. Gouge is now cleaning that top surface. The surface will be slightly convex and where the bead is we'll have a little step in of about an eighth of an inch. Now put in some soft paste wax on the top of here. This slightly softens those fibres and allows me to get a cleaner cut. I'm using the half inch skew chisel with the handle tilted down to create a sheer scraping cut just taking light shearing cuts across there to remove the little ripples and undulations that I got left from the gouge. I'm now rounding off the bead with a shear scraping cut. Now just checking the surface to see if I'm satisfied, and that looks good. Now going to round off the bottom radius to match the little bead at the top with the 3.8 beading tool. We now remove the lid. I'm now going to explain to you the remaining stages of making the basic beaded box. You've removed the lid and this is still a solid mass which is the base. First of all you cut a little recess in here with a parting tool. 
just to define the lid from the base. Once that is done, you then hollow the interior with a gouge, truing up the ripples with a scraper. Once you've tooled that to conclusion, you replace the lid, sanding the exterior to conclusion, removing the lid, sanding the interior to conclusion. You then apply whatever polishes, waxes, sealers that you wish to at that stage. Assemble it back together just to make sure that everything is you want it. From there you part in with an eight parting tool leaving about half an inch in the centre which you then cut through with a saw. The bottom is now ready to be finished off completely. Now cutting a little gap line with a 3 8 bead in parting tool to create the, the scale of the piece and it just hides the grain mismatch. On the size of this piece, the gap line needs to be about a sixteenth deep and about a sixteenth wide, and that puts it in proportion and scale with the overall piece. Put the lid back on to see that the gap line is correct. I'm now going to set the depth gauge to leave three sixteenths of stock in the bottom of the box. I'm now going to hollow the base of the box using the 3.8 spindle gouge that's been modified. The first thing we do is to bore a hole in there. The flute of the gouge is 10 or 15 degrees from the vertical. Once we start hollowing, it's applied with the flute 45 degrees out of the vertical. You can see that pivoting fulcrum position again. We bore deeper. just continue hollowing in the same mode every time. This is similar to how we hollowed out the top, only this time we've got to go much deeper. The deeper you go, the more difficult it becomes, particularly in enclosed pieces. Just work in the outside wall. When you're working on these pieces, you have to be careful not to leave a nub in the middle there when you start hollowing away. You'll note that all the cuts to remove the material are from the middle of the box in the base cutting upwards towards the top. They're quite aggressive in the early stages when you're trying to remove a lot of the mass quickly. Once you get nearer the objective the cuts become very much more refined and more delicate. I'm now going to refine that interior with a scraper. This is the modified three-quarter inch scraper. Wall thickness is getting thinner. So this is where the fingers go out and help support. This absorbs any vibration that's there and the high-pitched squeal that sometimes you get using up that wall. As you go deeper and thinner, you tend to get a vibration through the piece. You go into the bottom there, slide it across like a travis across the bottom, into that corner, and then we go up the side wall, up and draw in towards you. We want that to be parallel. We've replaced the lid and now we're ready to sand the piece. Go through the same process as we did on the lid. 
They use the wax as a lubricant to minimise the friction heat. This helps sand the piece much cleaner. As I said earlier, I use totally silicon carbide papers. I go through the grits, starting with 150 grit and going on down to a 400 grit as a raw. We sand the outside first, we remove the lid and then we sand the interior. What you should never do in making a box is to sand the exterior while the base is still a solid mass. You'll get a distortion of the lid almost immediately because the, the lid is hollow and the base is solid and you'll get an uneven shrinkage. You must do all the sanding and finishing when the piece is hollowed to conclusion. After the final sanding, what I'm looking to do is to have no scratch marks there at all. A very fine silky surface. What I normally do is to sand down to 400 grit and hopefully have the surface free of uh, scratch marks. And just as a final finish, I use 4.0 steel wool. Again, this is dipped in the wax as the lubricant. And by the time that has happened, you'll have a very clean surface, ready to apply your finish on. use the lacquer just as we did on the inside of the lid. This is a satin lacquer that being used as a sealer. The lathe is stopped and being spread evenly on a soft cloth or kitchen towel. Then I friction dry this. Once that's done, I remove the lid and seal the interior. Again with the lathe static, just revolving it by hand, spreading that lacquer more evenly. If you've run the lathe, you won't have enough lacquer and you'll get a motley finish. Just working that into that little gap line. I'm putting a little on the tenon there, or the spigot, as it was just a fraction loose on this box, that lid fit. And that will just give you enough body for it to be a better fit. I don't normally like to do that, it should be clean from the tool. Now we've put the lacquer on, this needs to be cut back with the steel wool again, dipped in the wax. This helps prevent the build-up of the sealer. It minimises the friction heat. If you just use the steel wool with it dry, it could drag the lacquer as it may not be totally cured. By this method, this eliminates this happening. Remove that surplus wax with that soft cloth and reassemble the box here just to get the rest of that surplus wax that we have over that lacquer from the residue on the steel wall.
Once that's done, I now apply the final polish. This is a high quality, soft paste wax. Again applied with the lathe static, this particular wax dries extremely quickly. Then polish this with a soft cloth to give an excellent sheen. Personally, I don't like high gloss finishes. I like to have a satin finish. If I get a high finish, I normally cut it back slightly with the 4-0 steel wool so it's a satin sheen rather than a very high gloss. Put the wax in the inside again with the lathe static. Now just final polish, buffing this off. The reason for not liking high gloss finishes, I think it makes wood look rather more like plastic rather than natural. Once we've finished uh, polishing, we're now ready to part the base away from the chuck. We remove the lid from the piece and then with the eight parting tool we cut in there, reducing this down so we're left with about a three-eighths or a half inch tenon. We're now ready to cut the base off with a saw here. This is again for safety and stopping tear out in the bottom of the piece. All that needs to be done now is to tool the bottom of the box. We check the dimensions with a vernier caliper and then we can cut our spigot to fit. This is done with a 3-8 beading parting tool. I usually cut the spigot on the waste block longer than the protruding spigot on the base of the box. Otherwise you could break that spigot as it will be quite weak. I'm using again the little 3-8 spindle go with the long angle, cutting that clean, making that base slightly concave so that it will sit without rocking on the outside diameter. Just going to take that little modified half inch skew to sheer scrape across there with the handle tilted down just removing the little ripples and undulations that I got from the gouge. Now just using the point I'm making two little lines, incised lines there, just to make it look as though you've taken a lot of trouble over the finish of that base. To me the base of the box is equally as important as every other part of it. To me what you should be looking for is a quality throughout the piece. The first thing I ever do when I look at a piece is to turn it upside down. That tells me a great deal about the pride of the maker in his work. For me, everything should be of the same quality, whether internally, externally, or on the very base there. The box is now finished, as you can see. The underside of it, as with those incised lines, indicates that the box was reverse turned, not just taken to a sander and disc. Now we've shown you the various steps of making a basic box, why don't you select a piece of cheap sound material and go into the workshop and make a piece.